Okay, so uh, we have the honor to to welcome you, Dr. Faris Stefan, and uh, it's a, cr a very big pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you for this nice uh, introduction. Um, so um, I will share my presentation. You screen the presentation or not? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Okay, just one second. So uh, I'll do a presentation uh, concerning the skin manifest of uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. So, uh, sorry. So I will start uh, with a little bit of uh, history and uh, art. I'm showing you this uh, sculpture. Uh, I will talk about it later on. Uh, at the end of the presentation, but ju but just uh, focus now on the on the foot of this uh, uh, sculpt. I will talk about it later on. So before uh, starting my presentation, uh, if we see uh, search PubMed on COVID uh, manifestations or COVID related uh, articles, we can see that uh, in 2020 and 2021 we have a real avalanche of research publications. Uh, from January 1, 2020 to November 2, 2020, we had almost 58,000 articles in PubMed uh, on COVID-19. So it's really huge. I think now we are around uh, more than 60,000. And if we compare to the articles that uh, uh, treated the H1N1 influenza pandemic during the years 2009-2010, uh, it was around 300, uh, 3,300 articles. So by far, we, are, we, we have maybe 20 more uh, the number of, uh, of articles that was uh, published in PubMed during these two years. So I will try to summarize a little bit uh, what we had during this, this year. Uh, first of all, uh, a little bit of epidemiology. And as you will see during this presentation, the incidence of cutaneous manifestations is really very difficult to estimate. And you may see that uh, depending on the, on the publications, it may vary from 0.8% to 20 and even 30% in some, uh, some publications. Why do we have this uh, variation in incidence? Because of two mainly. First of all is the inclusion bias. Uh, and in the inclusion bias, um, it depends on the reporting team. So if the reporting team was a dermatolo was dermatologist or ICU physicians. So as you know, ICU phys physicians don't have real experience in skin uh, uh, symptoms and signs, so they call it a rash or dermatitis. Uh, but if the dermatologists are reporting the the the, the the manifestations, we, we have increased uh, incidence and really uh, very uh, specific signs and symptoms. Second bias is um, either the COVID infection was confirmed or not. As you know, uh, sometimes we have uh, suspected COVID infection, but the PCR is negative and the PCR, the sensitivity is not very high, so around 70%. So we have multiple uh, uh, publications that uh, did not uh, differentiate between confirmed or not confirmed COVID infection. And that's why we have this, uh, these differences uh, probably in the incidence. So second bias is the analysis bias. First of all, we, the confusion with other uh, drug-induced eruptions. Uh, as you may know, so COVID-19 patients uh, normally uh, receive uh, multiple drugs, especially into the hospital. So sometimes we don't know if the eruption is due to the drug or due to the COVID infection. Uh, second, uh, the, re the reactivation of other viruses. So is it due directly to the COVID or is it due to a reactivation like we may see in the reactivation of the group, the herpes group uh, viruses? Uh, finally, the pathogenic mechanism is partially understood, so we don't know exactly the pathophysiology. We have some theories, uh, like for example, in severe cases, it may be due to uh, major coagulation disorders, in benign cases, probably infection of the endothelial cells or classical paraviral uh, eruptions. 
So I will start with this presentation, with this article that was published in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology in 2020. Um, and this was a French uh, cohort in uh, Hôpital Cochin, I think. So they, they did a, their cohort and they uh, analyzed the, the data with the review, the systematic review of the literature. So uh, they classified, the, before classification, uh, some epidemiology in this cohort and in this review. So the incidence is, is varies between 0 0.2 to 8 percent, the age between 42 to 48, uh, the mean delay between the onset of respiratory symptom uh, and the cutaneous manifestations was around 7 or 6.8 days, and the mean duration of skin lesions was uh, 9 days. Second thing interesting in this publication was the classification of the skin uh, uh, manifestations into five types, eczema, uh, chillblains or pernios, April necrosis, livedo, and, and pruritus. So as you can see, the, by far the most frequent manifestations were exanthema and pruritus, around 70% uh, of the cases. And so, uh, other thing uh, important in this uh, review was the association to severe cases in 64% uh, of the patients uh, having exanthema and only 5% of the patients having uh, chillblains. In the same publication, uh, as you can see in this uh, slide, um, depending on the country, uh, the incidence varies a lot. So as you can see in China, the incidence was around 0.2%. In Italy, it goes up to 20%. In France, and in this cohort, specific cohort, it was around 1%, and the average was 1.7%. Last thing, very important in this, in this publication, they tried to uh, study the four major complications of uh, COVID infection. So mainly pneumonia, hospital admission, transfer to CCU, and death. And they tried to link this to the skin eruption. And as you can see, the difference was statistically significant between rash and chillblains. So rash was statistically significant, uh, uh, associated more with pneumonia and hospital admission, transfer to CCU, and death. So when a patient presents with a rash, the risk of complication is much higher than a patient presenting with uh, burns. So let's go uh, uh, quickly into the clinical presentations. What can we see in these patients? As you can, you will see in the, the, the few slides that will follow, the, the presentation is very polymorphous, so we can see anything. We'll start with the vesicular eruption. Um, mainly the, these uh, cases are taken from uh, the British Journal of Dermatology. It was in a Spanish uh, cohort. So a vesicular eruption, as we can see in, uh, as we may see in uh, varicella, sometimes it's vesicular necrotic type, like in uh, severe varicella in immunocompromised patients. Uh, vesicular type, uh, desiderotic type, mainly on the hands and on the feet. Sometimes pseudo vesicular, uh, especially on the extension areas, elbows, sometimes on the hands mimicking uh, erythema elevatum diotenum, urticarial eruption, as we may see in any viral infection, uh, urticarial eruption on the uh, elbows, and I have seen many patients presenting even a few weeks after uh, COVID infection with this specific crash on the elbows, uh, urticarial but fixed, uh, resembling a little bit uh, genotic rusty syndrome in, in, in uh, pediatric patients. So specific lesions on the elbows. Maculopapular rash that we may see in uh, any viral infection or drug uh, eruption. Maculopapular uh, rash, pityriasis rosea like uh, We have many uh, reported uh, cases in the literature. Um, for pityriasis rosea uh, in patients hospitalized for uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, 
sometimes it may be the leading manifestation, like in this article that we published uh, in the Journal of the European Academy in Dermatology in November 2020. So it was uh, a female patient, um, a young female patient, uh, presenting to the clinic for this typical pityriasis rosea -like, like, uh, rash with this uh, herald patch on the on the thigh and the typical rash. And so we, we, we said to the patient, she was totally as, asymptomatic uh, otherwise. So we told the patient that she had pityriasis rosea. And then the day uh, uh, after, she called the clinic to tell us that she had fever and cough, so uh, we did a PCR and the PCR turned to be uh, positive. So it was a leading manifestation of COVID-19. And in this case, it may be directly linked to the COVID-19 infection or to a viral reactivation uh, like the HHV6, 7 or EBV as previously reported. Erythema multiforme uh, like uh post viral or post uh, drug exposure a perforic eruption uh, sometimes as we see in uh, uh, viral infections like parvo uh, virus b19 uh, infections especially on the legs and on the uh, on the on the feet uh, but sometimes it a perforic eruption, uh, 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 different a little bit from, uh, like for this case, uh, presenting like a perforic eruption on the axilla bilateral presentation. Morbiliform uh, eruptions. Enantema. Perifollicular eruption, as you may see in this slide, and more on this one, so really perifollicular papules. Uh, livedoid or necrotic lesions, especially in severely uh, affected patients. So we see this more in the ICU uh, units in patients hospitalized for uh, infection. Pseudochilblain or pernu on the toes or on the fingers. sometimes with necrotic uh, area starting, as you can see here on the uh, big toe. So uh, these was where the, the, the clinical manifestations, so as you can see, it's really very, uh, very polymorphous. Another publication that we will, uh, I will present to you, uh, it was published in the Journal of the European American Academy of Dermatology last month. Uh, it was a worldwide review for skin manifestation of COVID-19. So one more time here, they classified the, the cutaneous manifestations into five uh, big uh, types. First of all, vasooclusal lesions. Uh, second, vesicular lesions. Third, urticarial lesions. Fourth, presentation uh, rashes containing macules and papules. And finally, the pseudo uh, chillblains. So five uh, uh, typical clinical presentations. What is very important, we will not go into details uh, in this epidemiological uh, uh, data, but uh, what's very important here, uh, so they studied the number, the, the, the median age, the sex, the region, the country, and the survival. So as you can see, the age, the median age varies uh, significantly between patients presenting with rash or patients presenting with uh, pernules. So patient, younger patients uh, present with pernules and more the, 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 adult, the, the older patients present with rashes and with, most, uh, with more severe uh, presentation. Second thing very important is the, the, the death rate or the survival rate. Uh, as you may see, in vaso when we have vasooclusive uh, lesions, uh, the survival rate is uh, only 78 or 79 percent. Uh, whether in uh, uh, pseudo chillblains or uh, pernules, survival rate is around 98.7 percent. So it appears like uh, pernule is relatively a sign of good prognosis in these patients. 
Second uh, finding important in this uh, same study. Um, so uh, it was the, as you can see in the, in the, 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 the slide, the five uh, uh, clinical presentations that we already talked about. And they tried to see for each one of this presentation, uh, the timing of the skin eruption. So you can see uh, whether the timing was before the COVID-19 symptoms, uh, together with the COVID-19 symptoms, after the COVID-19 symptoms, or eruption of lesions not documented. And one more time, uh, if we uh, dig in, into these, uh, this slide, we may see that the uh, pseudo chilblain lesions in 35% of the cases appear after the COVID-19 uh, uh, symptoms. And in 34.4%, uh, the patients do not have any other symptom, whether uh, uh, for rash containing papules and macules. Uh, in 55% of the cases, it appears together with the COVID-19 symptoms. So that's why I have the explanation myself, because uh, when uh, last year, when the pandemic started, when I used to see patients in my clinic uh, presenting with the pernio, uh, because it was the first cutaneous sign documented uh, and published. So when I was, used to see patients with pernio, I immediately asked for a PCR and I asked for, for the symptoms of COVID. And none of my patients uh, presenting to me in the clinic with pernio uh, uh, got a positive PCR. So most probably that uh, they had already had their, their COVID uh, before. It was asymptomatic COVID uh, or maybe a, a false uh, negative PCR. But the possibility of having uh, COVID uh, before and then uh, the pernio is uh, very important, as you can see in this uh, Article. So all these findings, um, we can summarize them in this uh, slide. So uh, if you want to remember only one slide from my presentation, just remember this one. Uh, and it was uh, published in the Journal of Europe of the American Academy of Dermatology last October. Uh, and as you can see, uh, depending on the uh, severity on the on the on the clinical presentation of the dermatological signs, uh, we may predict the severity of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, Pernio is associated with less severe uh, presentation and retiform purpura is associated with more severe presentation. And in between, we have this polymorphous uh, presentation, vesicular, urticarial, macular, uh, or more biliform rash. So when we look into the patients presenting with pernio, only 16% will be hospitalized. And in the patients presenting with uh, retiform purpura, 82%, uh, 100%, sorry, will be hospitalized and 82% will have, will, have, will have a severe disease with ARDS. And in between, we will have around 22 to 45% of the patients uh, hospitalized. So uh, just a few uh, slides concerning the cytokine storm, because we are uh, hearing more and more about this, uh, this uh, clinical uh, complication. And we as dermatolog dermatologists, we must uh, know exactly this, this presentation. So uh, the course of the COVID-19 infection, we have the three main stages. Stage one is asymptomatic. Uh, stage two is symptomatic but not severe and stage three uh, we have severe inflammation and especially severe respiratory uh, manifestations and uh, it depends in fact on the level of the cytokine uh, that we will see in the blood of our uh, uh, patients so if the uh, the patient uh, the cytokine level uh, goes up and then down the patient will be uh, discharge on stage two and he will not have any severe manifestation and if the the cytokine level keeps uh, growing and coming up it will uh, go to stage three severe infection 
So, um, a very good article concerning cytokines uh, published in the New, New England Journal of Medicine. So, if uh, some of you are interested in medicine, internal medicine, they can go through this article. Very interesting. But just uh, uh, I'm putting this slide just to show you that the cytokine store will affect all the body organs from the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the vascular system, lymphatic, the nervous system, the heart, the rheumatological system, gastrointestinal, and of course, the skin. And it is mainly due to uh, release of cytokines. We will not go through the pathophysiology, of course, it's really very complicated. But if you um, uh, can see in this slide that uh, if we can target these cytokines, it could be uh, very interesting in the treatment of cytokine stores. So uh, just to summarize, it's a massive release of cytokines leading to hyperinflammation state and visceral uh, deficiency. And the causes of the cytokine storm are, uh, we have many causes in the, that we can talk about. The, you can see in this slide, uh, if you related to dermatology, like infections, any infection, autoimmune disorders like uh, systemic lupus, erythematosus, still disease, cancers, T-cell lymphoma, melanoma, actually melanoma is treated, treated with uh, antibira or MEC, uh, the hypersensitivity syndrome, drug-induced, the dress syndrome, uh, iatrogenic, mogamulizumab, uh, that we uh, use sometimes work for cutaneous lymphoma as well, and genetic deficiencies. So as you can see, we have many dermatological causes of uh, cytokine store. The pathophysiology, cytotoxic effect of T-cells, uh, activation of macrophages and secretion of cytokines like IL-1 betas, IL-6, IL-8, uh, TNF-alpha, so targeting IL-6, IL-8 or IL-1 or TNF-alpha would be uh, beneficial in these patients. So how do, we, how do we diagnose the cytokine storm? The clinical presentation is very low in specificity. Uh, Patients present with fever, unexplained fatigue, malaise, hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, confusion, headache, digestive problems, uh, myalgia, splenomegaly. And so in these patients, we should go for biologic markers, which are very, are very important. Uh, CRP is high, ferritin level is high, LDH is high. We have cytopenia, increased liver enzymes, hypertriglyceridemia, very important, and elevated D dimers. Of course, we have cytokine levels that we can um, do, but it's it, um, we don't have it in, the re in regular uh, labs. Uh, another topic other than the uh, cytokine storm is the lung COVID, because we are hearing more and more about uh, these, these terms. So lung COVID, we have a, a very good uh, review in The Lancet in January uh, 2021. Uh, and there is a part of dermatology in this present in this uh, article. So they uh, classified long COVID in four uh, main uh, cutaneous uh, signs or symptoms: the morbidly form rash, and the medium median was seven days only. The urticarial eruptions it can go to 28 days after the COVID. Papulosquamous eruptions 20 days till 70 days after the COVID, and pernio the median. Uh, was 15 days, and sometimes it can go up to uh, 60 days, so around two months after the COVID infection. So, urticarial and morbidiform eruptions were relatively ephemeral. Uh, papulosquamous eruptions, and particularly pernio, were long-lasting. Patients with ex who experienced long uh, COVID symptoms in dermatology dominant COVID-19 raised questions about persistent inflammation even in patients who initially experienced relatively mild COVID-19. So I'm showing you this patient uh, uh, that I saw uh, in the beginning of the pandemic uh, for uh, pernios, and she was a young patient. It was uh, not, she was not symptomatic, but the PCR was uh, positive. So this uh, picture was during COVID infection. And then it healed completely after a few days. And then later on, his father 
who is uh, an anesthesiologist as well. So sent me this, these pictures after four months. Uh, she had a new uh, eruption of Pernios and we, uh, we were in September, so it was not uh, very cold. Uh, we did a new PCR and the new PCR was negative. So it was not a new infection. It was a long COVID, but really very, very long in this case, four months. Uh, another question raised, uh, very important, uh, it was raised in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and it is uh, of value in our clinical practice as well. Uh, is SARS-CoV-2 uh, screening test indicated for psoriasis patients candidate for a biologic therapy? So let's say I see a patient, for, uh, a psoriatic patient, and for this patient I decide to give a biologic treatment. Uh, during pandemic, if the patient is asymptomatic, uh, shall I do a screening test? So uh, in this review, they came to a conclusion that so far, no increased risk of severe COVID-19 associated with biologics when compared to the general population. And at the moment, and with the current available diagnostic test, uh, there's not enough evidence to support a universal testing in asymptomatic patients candidate for biologic therapy. It is not the case in, uh, with our colleagues in gastroenterology, because in gastroenterology, they recommend a screening for SARS-CoV-2 uh, for IBD patients who initiate a biologic treatment. And in this same article, they say that it could be due mainly to the fact that COVID-19 may present with only fever and gastrointestinal symptoms mimicking an IBD flare. So that's why uh, patients with IBD before starting uh, the biologic treatment, it would be beneficial to do the screening for uh, COVID-19. Another question, COVID-19 and the use of immunomodulator and biologic agents for severe cutaneous disease. Uh, these was, were the recommendations of the Australian and New Zealand uh, Dermatological uh, Society and published in the, uh, their journal in 2020. They are very conservative here and they say that uh, in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 disease, all immunomodulator used in skin disease should be immediately withheld with the possible exception of systemic steroids. And in patients who develop symptoms or signs of an upper respiratory tract infection, but COVID-19 is not confirmed, they consider those reduction. I will show you the table uh, in the next slide, what they mean by uh, those reduction. Uh, and of course, uh, it should be uh, a case by case study. So uh, here is in the same uh, article. So they go into, uh, uh, the, the, the effect of every agent that we used and the, the, the risk of infection. But the, what is important is the dose uh, reduction. As you can see, uh, they recommend, for example, for methotrexate reduced to less than 10 milligrams per week. Uh, and for biologic, those are, uh, consider ex uh, extending the time between, uh, between dosages. But it's not uh, uh, proven uh, till now, but I thought it was good to mention it. What about the vaccines? Uh, the American Rheumatological Association, um, they, rec they gave a good recommendations for the vaccine. And as you can see in patients with biological treatment, they don't recommend any uh, change in the vaccine uh, timing. Uh, only for methotrexate and JAK inhibitor, they recommend holding it for one week uh, after each vaccine uh, dose. And finally, so the guidance to hold a therapy was made based on assumption that the patient was well enough controlled uh, in, this, in his disease to allow a temporary interruption. And consensus was not reached for vaccination timing in patients receiving prednisone uh, equivalent dose for more than 20 milligrams a day. When if it, uh, if it is less than uh, 20 milligrams a day, they don't recommend a change in the vaccination uh, timing. So uh, finally, I'm showing you uh, this uh, same uh, picture. It was a 
sculpture that was done by a French sculpture, sculpt and sculpture and the painter in the uh, 19th century. Uh, as you can see in the foot, we see the Babinski sign. So he 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 uh, sculpted a, this sculpture without knowing uh, that he was describing one of the signs of the syphilis. And why am I talking about syphilis? Because syphilis is for a long time uh, considered as the great simulator, la grande simulatrice uh, in French. Uh, but I think that this great simulator probably is uh, dethroned now by the COVID-19 because uh, it may really present with many, with a very polymorphous uh, eruption. At, it can be, it can induce the clinician, the clinician uh, wrongly into uh, another uh, diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much for the presentation, the nice presentation. Um, probably the question will come uh, after the presentation of Dr. Christian Deal as well. Um, so I think that we, we should be able to, uh, to listen to you, Dr. Christian Deal, and then after that, uh, we should have some questions to answer. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I am very impressed by uh, Dr. Stefan's presentation. Really, it was brilliant. It was complete, well documented, and uh, I never heard something so uh, complete about uh, COVID-19. And uh, I perfectly share his impression about syphilis. All over the presentation, I was thinking also about syphilis. And, and uh, really, uh, COVID-19 is a great uh, simulator in terms of uh, dermatological symptoms, no doubt about this. And now uh, my part is uh, dedicated to uh, normal people or not affected people by COVID-19. And we'll talk about uh, first uh, the consequences and impact on uh, these people of uh, frequent uh, hand washing with alcoholic solutions and uh, wear of uh, face masks. And uh, there are interesting studies about this, about uh, physiological changes in the characteristics of the skin when wearing a mask. And this is a Korean study on voluntaries wearing a KF94 mask uh, six hours per day. And after the results, were published after six weeks. And uh, in parallel, of course, uh, we had volunteers uh, not uh, wearing the mask. And so we can see the difference. And you see that the difference uh, within not one day, but uh, only six hours is quite high in terms of skin temperature. There is an increase of a little more than two degrees in six hours uh, because of wearing this mask. It's important. And the red component was increased also because there is some kind of inflammation uh, and uh, this is not a good condition for the skin, wearing this mask in a permanent way. And also, there is uh, an increase, important increase, in uh, transepidermal water loss, and uh, skin is drying because of wearing the mask. And most important, you can see, is the increase of sebum production by uh, almost 80%, a very uh, high increase. And we'll see that this increase in sebum production has the consequence, of course, on uh, worsening or uh, occurrence of acne. And uh, you see, after two weeks, uh, these uh, changes are uh, quite important. Elasticity was not very affected by only six hours. But after two weeks, uh, you have uh, quite uh, an important loss of elasticity of the skin. In the meantime, uh, pore's dimension was not affected in only one day, 
but after two weeks, you see that there is a quite an important enlargement of the pores. And also, I told about this uh, number of acne lesions uh, directly related with the increase in uh, sebum production. Uh, this uh, increase of acne lesions is important. Another Korean study uh, with uh, uh, the same uh, protocol, let's tell, of uh, wearing the same mask during six hours per day and results after four weeks, but it's more oriented on skin wrinkles and pores. And you, you see that uh, there is quite a, a small increase in skin wrinkles. Uh, there is a really, there is no big variation, no big difference, but in terms of skin pores, you see that enlargement was confirmed compared, compared with the first uh, study. And uh, there was a subjective questionnaire, uh, interesting, uh, asking the, the volunteers if they are thinking that wearing a mask can affect their skin. And most of them, of course, were uh, thinking that uh, it was important in their skin condition. Uh, wearing a mask uh, could be really affecting their skin condition. So we have uh, some uh, publications about uh, increase of acne outbreaks uh, when wearing a mask. We are talking about acne patients with uh, acne previous to this uh, COVID situation and to this obligation of wearing a mask. And in this case, uh, there is an increase of acne outbreaks. And uh, there are interesting uh, publications about this. And all of the authors, uh, I didn't make an exhaustive research about it, because as uh, Dr. Stefan was uh, telling, there are a lot of publications, even only in dermatology, about consequences of uh, this uh, pandemic. But all uh, published data are uh, confirming that there is an increased flare of acne caused by uh, wearing a face mask. And you see here that this patient uh, has uh, increased flare and outbreaks. And also, uh, we can have a de novo occurrence of acne when wearing a mask. This is a barmaid in Italy. And uh, she was uh, using a mask, of course, during her whole uh, eight hour work shift. She's obliged to do this. And uh, this is very wise, of course. And previously, she had no acne. Uh, previously to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, no acne, but facial seborrhea. But she had never suffered acne lesions, really. And as we could see, uh, wearing the mask all over the day is increasing uh, sebum production. And in case of a uh, uh, person having previous facial seborrhea, what happened? She had uh, occurrence of acne, acne lesions uh, consisting in numerous papers, pustules, and microcomedons. And this uh, de novo occurrence of acne with face mask has a name in English, and it's a very nice name, is maskne. It's uh, like a, a typical uh, specific acne uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, erythematous eruption may also be observed. Uh, this patient was disinfecting her face with uh, alcohol 60% five times a day and using the mask during six consecutive hours per day. And you see the consequence, it's uh, erythematous eruption. Rosacea also, uh, there may be 
occurrence of rosacea in patients with face mask. In this case, it appeared two weeks after starting confinement in Italy. Uh, there was a previous history of flushing, but nothing else. No specific symptoms of uh, erythematotel injectasic or papulopustular acne. Only flushing. And uh, after that, uh, this use, uh, regular use of face mask during uh, work shift, then there was occurrence of acne. And this was healed by uh, doxycycline 40 milligrams per day during 12 weeks. Uh, let's tell a very uh, classical treatment, uh, typical of acne. Another case, it's a, a patient uh, 56 years old uh, without clinical story and without clinical story of uh, rosacea, uh, exclusion of uh, diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis by patch test, and on the contrary, diagnosis of papulopustular rosacea. It was healed by another classical treatment, metronidazole one gram per day during two weeks, plus uh, pimecrolimus cream, 1% during uh, twice a day during the same period. And uh, it must be noted that erythematous rosacea persisted after this treatment. Uh, papers and pustules disappeared, but there was a persistence of uh, erythema. Well, this is a very frequent uh, case, is exacerbation of lesions of seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, this is one case from Italy also, patient 29 years old. Uh, he was treated with uh, topical corticosteroid for five days, followed by topical 1% uh, pimecrolimus during 10 days. And this is very frequent. Uh, we'll see the statistics. Uh, it's very common. And you see that it may be uh, very severe. And then you have, uh, it's uh, obvious that this is due to uh, wearing face mask uh, due to the location of the exacerbation of the worsening. And you see that this of worsening of lesions of seborrheic dermatitis, it can impact between 36 and 46 percent of patients. Uh, it means a, a good percentage, uh, important percentage. The same for worsening of acne lesions, 43 percent. Uh, rosacea, 100 percent. In, uh, in this study, all patients having previously rosacea were uh, worsened uh, there was exacerbation uh, during use of face mask. Uh, we can have also occurrence of pruritus in 15%, occurrence of erythema in 12.6%, uh, skin dryness, we told about it. Uh, there is really uh, increase of uh, uh, loss of, of uh, water, of uh, uh, TEWL, and the consequence will be increase and in occurrence of skin dryness and others. And you see that all these uh, symptoms are uh, uh, mean 49% uh, of patients. It's a, it's a huge percentage. And also uh, contact dermatitis when uh, using a face mask. Uh, because in the face mask, whatever it uh, be, uh, there are a lot of possible allergens. Uh, Dibromo dicyanobutan, which is a preservative in the face mask, formaldehyde, it's very classical allergen, uh, which is used in the course of manufacturing process. Uh, furam in the elastic of the mask, uh, cocopropylene diamine, Guanididium diacetate is another preserva preservative uh, usually used in face masks. Uh, there are residues of polyrefin as part of the manufacturing process. 
uh, triglyceride is also elaborated as hardener, and bronopol may be another uh, allergen, uh, which is an impurity in the manufacturing process. So, contact dermatitis when using face mask is quite common. Even uh, severe contact dermatitis, like in this uh, uh, patient. And now, alcoholic gel, of course, uh, hand dermatitis is possible with uh, repeated use of alcoholic gel uh, under the form of erythematous patches or uh, also uh, classical contact dermatitis and especially with isopropylic alcohol. And uh, ethylic alcohol, ethanol, it's uh, better, maybe more expensive, but uh, safer in this way. And now, uh, we paid uh, particular attention to healthcare workers, you know, and there is a good study about this, about the impact of using alcoholic gel and face mask among this population. And first, frequency of hand washing with uh, healthcare workers during a regular shift is uh, mostly 80%, almost, more than 10 times a day, and 20% uh, almost uh, five to 10 times, and only one to four. Of course, we know, all of us, we know that we have to have uh, regular uh, hand washing in our practice. And consequence, uh, there are consequences on the hands, of course, as we told it, redness, soreness, uh, skin cracks, uh, peeling or scaling of the skin, skin thickening and swelling. And you see that uh, in uh, uh, all these uh, uh, symptoms, all these factors are much more important on the back of hands. This is the most impacted location in the hand when we are hand washing with alcoholic solution. And after that, web spaces and fingers are also affected. But you see that on the contrary, fingertips, for instance, are not affected by this uh, treatment. About face mask, uh, the most affected uh, areas are nose and cheeks, and uh, we can also uh, observe soreness, redness, dryness, blistering, blemishes, and skin thickening. But you know that Obviously, on forehead, you, we are not wearing the mask and there is no risk. On the ears, only for soreness because of the elastics. And on the chin, uh, some effect, some impact, but much less than in the cheeks and nose. And you see that uh, there is a big difference between the masks. If you are using surgical masks, uh, as we uh, usually do it, the risk is not so important and frequency of these symptoms is not high. But in case of uh, FFP3 mask, uh, there is much higher frequency of uh, symptoms. Well, this is interesting. Uh, this is coming from India and nobody thinks so much about this. Uh, at, uh, Mostly at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a closure of uh, doctor's offices and uh, the patients were quite afraid and uh, staying home and so on. And uh, there was a lesser number of visits to the doctors. And as a consequence, abuse of self-medication. And in uh, dermatolo dermatology, especially, uh, oral steroids, topical steroids, antibiotics, antifungals, antihistaminics, this is not so important, uh, these ones are uh, more important, of course, and even uh, immunomodulators like bifotrexate or uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, abuses were reported in their uh, used by self medications by patients. 
and uh, we we must be uh, careful about this and maybe ask the patients when there was a, a quite a long delay between the visits uh, what they did in the meantime well i i checked also uh, dermatological side effects of covid-19 vaccination because uh, there is more and more vaccination uh, hopefully and uh, we'll have more and more side effects and uh, the most common side effect is uh, injection site rash like in the case of this uh, colleague she is a dermatologist and uh, dermat uh, contact dermatitis also and urticaria there are the most frequent uh, side effects when uh, there is covid vaccination but uh, it's not uh, very important uh, look at the percentages uh, this is not frequent but you must know about it and in case of having a, a presentation of a case we must know about this and this is another uh, important side effect after covid 19 vaccination this lady uh, had a filler injection three days after uh, covid vaccination and you see that there was a lip angioedema a very important one and of course i can imagine that uh, this patient was not very satisfied and uh, in this paper uh, we have reports of three cases similar to this one so i think the recommendation to our patients if yesterday they had a covid vaccination and today they are coming from a filler injection uh, we must tell them to wait at least one week between both and we must all remember uh, about covid 19 in our office protecting our employees with uh, uh, spectacles with face mask also with some uh, physical barrier when it's possible and uh, protect ourselves of course uh, giving to the patients uh, the, the way to wash their hands and to take uh, due uh, measures in order to protect themselves but also ourselves and protect the patients and especially uh, in the waiting room uh, before the pandemic we were used to see uh, very full waiting rooms i think this is no more time for this and we must uh, try to uh, put some distance between uh, our patients for their protection and uh, which are uh, LSI Sildava products to be used with a face mask when there is occurrence of worse or worsening of lesions of seborrheic dermatitis uh, or uh, acne lesions quasic gel is giving very good results and uh, uh, some colleagues tried it and reported very good results for quasic cream of course in case of occurrence of worsening of rosacea lesions in case of uh, contact dermatitis erythema pruritus and dermatitis uh, sodermic cream may be recommended uh, with success and you know the products of course thank you very much for your attention thank you very much and have a nice evening thank you very thank much you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farid. Thank you very much, Dr. Christian Deal. And uh, uh, we hope to see you uh, in the near future again. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.